people of Rundit who've encountered serial killers before they were caught. What is your story and how did you find out who they were? A serial killer lived in the street behind my aunt's house. Us kids went to a party next door to his house. We'd all seen the guy. Seemed like a harmless old man. A bit scary but harmless. Then the police dug up his patio and found the bodies of two young women buried underneath. He'd also killed some women up north. That was an odd time. I lived next door to a guy that was named the cowboy killer I was maybe 4 or 5 when my sister and I would get babysat by him and his wife. My mom told me his wife would come over pounding on our door in the middle of the night because he would choke her in his sleep. Anyway he ended killing some prostitutes and getting caught. This was in Auburn Wall around 1990. I actually knew one of the girls he murdered. She worked for my dad when I was a youngster and when I would go to his shop she would always try to teach me something. I was pretty heartbroken when I found out what happened to her. When my mom was 16 she was sleeping and woke up to someone trying to open her bedroom window. She ran to my grandma's room and told her someone was trying to break in. My grandma, being the crazy awesome lady she is, grabs a bat and runs outside and confronts this guy and starts swinging. The guy runs off and they don't think too much of it. Some time later my grandma sees the guy on the news and it's Richard Ramirez. My mom told this story over and over when I was growing up. She easily could have been one of his victims. I'm so grateful she wasn't especially since she was pregnant with me at the time. Good thing your grandma was so batty. An old boss went to the University of Utah and was in a sorority. One day she was waiting for her date in front of her sorority house with a girlfriend who was also waiting for her date. Her girlfriend's date pulls up, but her girlfriend forgets something and runs back in the house. My former boss chatted to the man for a few minutes. She noted that he was polite and handsome. Her girlfriend comes out and they leave in his VW Beetle. My former boss gets picked up by her date a short while later, and she thinks nothing of it. The next day she sees her girlfriend and asks how the date was. The girlfriend says that they started driving in her date's VW Beetle and all of a sudden she got a splitting headache. She thought it was really strange but she felt nauseous. She apologized and asked him to take her home. He was a little upset but he dropped her back off. They didn't go out again. Years pass, and my former boss is watching the news one night and sees a familiar man on the screen. It was Ted Bundy. She's the main character. That was too much plot armor to ignore. My aunt went to high school with Canada's most notorious serial killer, Paul Bernardo. She still has the yearbook he signed. See you at the bus stop, Paul. For those who don't know, before he started murdering girls he was the Scarborough R rat pissed who stalked and violated dozens of young women and teenage girls, many of whom he stalked out at bus shelters in the neighborhood. One of my tutors at university seemed to have a very short temper. First tutorial session was okay, but he spent 5 minutes telling us how important attending his tutorials was. Tutorials are kind of viewed as optional, as they're to go over stuff covered in the lectures. Second tutorial, a few people didn't show up, and he spent 15 minutes ranting about their absence. Third tutorial, even more people didn't turn up, and he spent even longer ranting about it. After that, my friends and I decided it wasn't worth the hassle. Apparently he ranted about the absentees even more at the next tutorial, and I'm not sure if anyone managed to stick out the whole term of tutorials. He'd also help out in lab sessions and various other course related activities, but everyone found him slightly uncomfortable to deal with. After the exams, we had a bit of a party at someone's house to celebrate. A casual invite was extended to the lecturers, tutors and assistants who'd been involved in getting us through the year. He turned up. None of the other teaching staff did, and although not entirely welcome, hung around for a while. When things were winding down, I headed off, but when I spoke to the host of the party the next day, it turned out that Mr. Angry Tutor had ended up crashing on the living room floor with a load of the others, except they'd all arranged in advance to stay over, but had headed over, but had headed over, but had headed over. We commented on how odd he was, but didn't give it much more thought, until a few months later, when he was arrested for a violent murder involving dismemberment. He turned out to have a history of violence, and a lot of predatory and stalkerish behaviors. None of that he was a quiet man, kept himself to himself business. He had obvious anger issues and made people uncomfortable, and it didn't come as a complete surprise to find out how twisted he was. TLDR, 
Odd and angry university tutor turns out to be violent murderer. I'm reluctant to actually reveal who he is. He's still alive, in prison, and has continued to make a nuisance of himself with various legal challenges whilst incarcerated. If you want a clue, this happened in Bonnie, Scotland, about 20 years ago. Movie promo announcer voice. Cutting class was never like this. The tutor. Coming soon to a theatre near you. Actually a mass murderer. But I went to school with a guy who killed his brother, the brother's girlfriend and three kids and did horrible things to the bodies. He seemed like an okay guy. A little quiet. A little angsty. But who wasn't in high school. Was girlfriend. Not wife. My dad met Charles Manson in Yosemite. He says that's where a lot of runaways in the 60s went so he was probably out there trying to find vulnerable people. Was walking around with a guitar. Offered to sell my dad and his buddy weed. Also told them that he sold his soul to the devil. And that any man he pointed to right then and there could be dead in a second. If my dad and his friend wanted them to be. They were a little freaked out and were quick to get out of Yosemite entirely. My dad says that they drove for a while and saw Charles at a stop sign and it made no sense that he could have gotten there that fast. But I'm not entirely convinced that my dad wasn't just super baked haha. He had already committed the murders at this point, but Carrie Stainer tried to rent my neighbor's house. Me, 12 at the time, and my 17 year old sister would have probably been prime candidates for his next victims. He was found at the nudist colony down the street. Never met one but my great aunt was the original owner of the dog that David Berkowitz said talked to him. She should never have taught that dog to talk. I will not reveal too much information. Due to the sensitive nature of this topic, I am a US citizen who lived and studied abroad in Egypt during the late 2000s. I attended a large international school there. Many of the local Egyptian students were quite wealthy and came from very affluent families. There were several similar schools around Cairo, and it wasn't uncommon for large numbers of students to go out four nights on the town together, mixing and mingling with students from other schools. One evening, I found myself downtown at a fancy restaurant with a very large group of strangers. There must have been at least 30 of us crowded around a long row of tables. For whatever reason, the topic of bodybuilding eventually came up. I was quite scrawny at the time, still am, to some extent and asked if anyone had some tips for working out at Egyptian gyms. The guy seated across from me said that he would go get his friend, who was a devout bodybuilder, met the guy and we shook hands. He seemed nice enough, if not a bit dense, talked a lot like Sylvester Stallone, fancy smartphone, nice clothes, fresh haircut, a bro, if you will, gave me a few tips and went on his way. I remembered his face and name, but not much else. The next time I saw him was several years later, in international newspapers. I recognized not only his face and name, but most of the articles mentioned his passion for bodybuilding. His style had changed completely. That man had become one of the most brutal and feared terrorists working with ISIS, having personally tortured and beheaded hundreds of individuals, later posting the pictures online and bragging about it. Thankfully, it is believed that he eventually blew himself up after leaving a goodbye letter to his family. I was stunned. The guy seemed perfectly normal when I had met him, which makes it even more chilling. How did he end up the way he did? I'll never know. Not technically a serial killer but a mass murderer. James Holmes did a presentation at my middle school to teachers about the brain and nervous system. He seemed really smart and he joked around really well with all of us. He was the guy that let us hold a preserved brain, if that makes sense lol. Yeah, would have never known there was anything wrong with him but I only interacted with him briefly. From what I remember from when they interviewed his father, James become increasing strange as time went on. So he may have been perfectly mentally healthy when you interacted with him. My high school girlfriend's dad ended up being a murderer but not a serial killer. His persona was basically cool dad. He'd let my friends and I hang out at their house. Didn't bat an eye that I stayed there when he and her mom went out of town. Made drinks for us etc. But he also had a hard, sometimes sleazy, and definitely risk seeking edge. His wife ran a daycare and he kept between 10 and 15 loaded firearms in the house. And at one point, when he'd had a few drinks too many, he asked me how his daughter was with a knowing smirk. Five or so years later her mom had divorced him for being abusive, 
and he'd Ray married someone much younger and had a daughter with her. He made the news for unloading a clip into his new wife, reloading, and then unloading the second clip as well. He then put their infant child in the car, drove to the nearest airport, left the infant at the curb and hopped the first flight he could to Europe. He was eventually extradited back and, I think, is now serving a life sentence, but only after the district attorney agreed to drop the death penalty. Looking back, the only really spooky moment was when her mom caught us in bed together. They were home and we were decent. But she was really frantic about getting me into the guest room before he found us and freaked out. Something about the way she used that phrase suggested it would be a lot worse than just yelling. The dissonance of her reaction and the questions about his daughter and my private life was what stuck with me. Like he was asking a question to justify a rage. I work with a guy who is a sadistic sociopath and absolutely going to be a serial killer one day. Over the past two years he's been escalating his violence against women, assaults, debauchery, breaking into their houses to assault them, fraud, emptying their bank accounts, pathological lying to everyone. He'll put on the charm to attract a girlfriend and then systemically increase his abuse until they have a breakdown, usually working 2-3 targets at a time, some online while others are in person. He managed to pull off a catfish marriage and when the poor girl showed up he beat her, threw out her family heirlooms, sold her stuff on eBay, took her car keys, emptied her bank accounts and maxed out her credit card's line of credit. Told her one day she didn't live there anymore and if she came back from work that night and then freaking did it. He had already starting seeing his next girlfriend when she first arrived to move in. She had to move to the other side of the country after 3 months. He would go on to violate another girl, who reported it, and he then stalked and threatened her until she had a breakdown, eventually breaking into her house to assault her again. Although he is facing charges for the breaches and B&E. Nothing has stopped him at all. He's moving on to new victims now. Convinced the upcoming trial is all a plot by police because they are jealous of him and he's innocent. His kids are right fricked up too. CPS must have a dozen files on him. And somewhere they get to stay in that house. He's terrible at his job. But this is the military so he knows if he does just the minimum he won't get booted. At least not until the trials are done with. Eventually, yes, he will go down for what he does. But I can't stand that it won't be until there are many more victims and one of them wins up murdered. I have no doubt it is his goal to kill someone. Oh wow, that's absolutely terrifying. I mean the guy literally shows all the signs of someone who is building up to murder. Possibly multiple murders if he isn't stopped first. My school's art teacher was in the house during the Ted Bundy sorority massacre. A lot of her friends died. She was in a documentary about it and none of us ever knew. We just thought she was kinda weird. My buddy's dad was roommates with Jeffrey Dahmer at Ohio State. According to him he didn't last more than a quarter and would just roam around late at night while everyone was sleeping and microwaved weird foods and generally weirded everyone out and holy crap I might also be a serial killer. Haha <laughs> I did that too. To be fair, interesting people go around at night. I don't know if it's true but, one of my old teachers claimed she taught Jeffrey Dahmer how to speak German, claimed he was a nice kid, and good student. By all accounts he was a very nice, polite young man, except for the murdering part. There is a good graphic novel called My Friend Dahmer I Ike by a man who went to high school with him. It was a good read. Carla Homolka was the veterinary technician at the vet we took our dog to. I was super young and barely remember her, though my parents said she was sunny, vibrant, you'd never expect a thing. Paul Bernardo was the same, sunny disposition. The two of them earned the nickname of the Ken and Barbie killers for this reason. They both seemed lovely and you'd never expect a thing. This veterinary clinic was the same place she stole tranquilizers, with which she drugged some of the victims. I was a kid, he was a my doctor, can't remember much about him, but he seemed like a normal doctor. He then moved to his own private practice where he went on to murder around 250 patients. Not serial killer, but one of my mom's cousins snapped and killed his wife and children and himself a few years ago, and shot the wife's mother in the face with a shotgun. She lived, she's had a lot of reconstructive surgery for it and is actually able to eat again very recently. I see her once a year at a family reunion. 
From what I understand nobody expected it of him and he used to be a police officer. Really crazy. My mom gave Ted Bundy a ride. She was young and blonde. Very pretty. She said he was handsome and polite but she got an extremely odd vibe from him. He asked her some questions about her job, life, kids, then asked to be let off a couple blocks away. She said she recognized him on the news a couple years later. Bundy's victims were all brunettes, with long, center parted hair. Thankfully your mum wasn't his type. I graduated from the same high school as Tim McVeigh. He remains the only notable alumni. I graduated from the same high school as James Holmes. Our school is only about 10 years old so yeah he's our most notable alumnus. My neighbor was a serial debaucher. Apparently he used to lure women over for modeling shoots through Craigslist. He was also the DJ at my local watering hole. I got pretty tuned up one night and decided I wanted to hear Case's last ride. He responded that's not really the type of music we play here so I called him a crappy DJ. I was super embarrassed by my behavior. Later that week he got arrested and I was left with a strange sense of justification for my drunken antics. There was also a crap load of child p. Upskirt videos he would take at a bar and a jail cell in his basement. Hum I found out a karaoke DJ at a place I would go to was a registered diddler. But that could be a lot of things I suppose. Probably not the same person. There was a guy in Phoenix who went all Texas clock tower with a rifle, shooting people up on a public street. Phoenix police SWAT team eventually took him out. Several months later a friend of ours breaks out a picture of me sitting next to the guy at their Thanksgiving party chatting with him on a couch. Oddly enough he isn't the only person I have met that was killed by a SWAT team, but that is a story for another day. Cool, I'll come back tomorrow. I really didn't understand what was happening until a couple of years later. Got a bit older and understood what kidnapping and murder really is, which is when I remembered an incident that happened with my cousin and I. We were really young at the time. My cousin was a bit older than I was and I believe she is the reason I am still alive today. God knows what may have happened back then. We were in a small mall in our neighborhood. It was right across the street from the building we lived in. The mall had more than one entrance, and the back entrance was right across a school. My cousin and I were in the play area, where we usually go to most of the time in the mall, as a very old man came to us and asked us if we saw his kid. Being oblivious to the entire situation we went walking around the mall with him trying to find his kid. We got close to the back entrance of the mall and he asked us if we think his child went out from here. We said, maybe so we got out and started looking for him. As soon as we got out of the mall, the school was right in front of us, which had school buses parked outside. The old man said repeatedly I think I hear something behind the bus come with me. Luckily, my cousin was very afraid and refused to go and insisted we went back to the mall. After that incident happened, I didn't think of it at all until an old man was arrested for kidnapping children. The second I saw his picture I remembered it all like it was yesterday. Things like that are common lures. Because kids are inclined to trust other kids. It's a good thing your cousin had some understanding of what was going on. I'm from the Chicago area and my family grew up in the city. My dad's friend was offered a ride by John Wayne Gacy. He declined. And my art teacher was in Boy Scouts with his last known victim. He even put up missing child signs and everything. Oh, and my aunt once lived down the street from Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, before he went to live in the woods. Moral of the story, stay away from Illinois. Moral of the story, stay away from Illinois. As a native of the state, this is just good advice all around. My middle school and hall cafeteria monitor turned out to be a serial killer. I sat at a lunch table with some of the other social misfits, and the guy would spend 5-10 minutes each day just chatting with us. He was nice enough, he smelled a little bit, and I remember that he conversed with us like we were adults. He didn't treat us like crappy 12 year olds. I started at that school in September 1996, and apparently he took his first victim in October. He killed 7 more women over the next couple of years. By the time he was apprehended in September 1998, I had moved on to high school. Just about everyone in the school district knew him, so the anecdotes and analysis started to fly as soon as word started to trickle out about what he'd done. It turned out that he'd been hiding his victims bodies in the attic and basement of the house he shared with his parents. 
not me, but my boyfriend lived in the same dorm as the Craigslist killer in college. He said he seemed like a quiet nerdy guy. Apparently he found out he murdered someone by getting a call from a news station asking if he would comment on what happened. My sister had a class with him. She said he was super smart and she was peeved because she thought he'd wreck the curve. She also said he'd always offer to walk some of the women in the class to their cars if it was dark out when class was done. When I was a teenager, my church youth group visited another church in Olney, TX. One of the worship leaders there greeted us and led us in some songs. His name was Farayan Wardrip. A few years later, he was proven to have killed at least 5 women in our small area of north central Texas. He's currently serving consecutive life sentences. Not a serial killer, but my mom was murdered by her ex-fiance. Super weird guy, ultra OCD, wouldn't let us sit on his couch for fear of it getting too dirty. Fractured her finger because she spilled a drop of spaghetti sauce on his tile. Turns out he ran from California for a similar incident. Overall very odd guy, but could play the normal act really well. I am so sorry for your loss. I was in the military when this happened. This initially happened in the late 80s. First cousin of mine and his friend, S, were in a park when they saw a guy masturbating by a bridge. Being young teens, they started making fun of the guy. I believe he tried to get them to come join him, but eventually he chased them and vowed if he caught them he would kill them. They went home and told my uncle, who is probably 6 feet 5 inches and was pretty buff. He came back to the park and looked for the guy with them. I don't recall exactly what happened after, but the cops were called. The guy was found and charged with enticing a child and physical assault. Something along those lines. As my aunt told me, in 1991, she and my uncle started getting calls from reporters. They were asking about charges against a guy in the news, if his name was familiar, and what occurred with their son. You see, my aunt, uncle and their three kids lived in West Ellis, Wiss. At the time, the guy my cousin and his friend, S, ran into was none other than Jeffrey Dahmer. Cousin ended up on an episode of the Phil Donahue show with Tracy Edwards. The guy who was intended to be a victim but escaped and ended up getting Dharma caught. Now I am curious. I need to call them to get a refresher of events since that was almost 30 years ago. And to see if they still have the VHS tape from that show or if there is something on YouTube. I remember my cousin talking about this on the Donahue show and being so nervous I think he confused mimics and mocking him. Dharma. I felt bad for my cousin. Interestingly enough, on the 26th of July, 2011 Edwards was arrested and accused of throwing a man to his death off a Milwaukee bridge. Obligatory not me but my mom. My mom taught Paul Bernardo while he was in university. She had him switched to a different class due to him eyeing her down constantly. My mom was a young blonde at that point. She made sure not to go near him. Good call on her part. Had a neighbor who turned out to be a murderer was a retired sergeant, had loving kids who visited a lot, lived with his wife and seemed very happy. He shared some dishes with us. He later disappeared, hid after being a major suspect in the murder of his wife's lover. Few months later, he shows up at our doorsteps. Out of shock, my mom let him in. She said he looked the same, acted the same, and treated her the same. Except he kept asking about his wife and kids and asked if his car got totaled by the police. That's the car where the body was found, bound and mangled and shot in different places. I felt my mom's terror recalling the event. When I was in elementary school I had a girl I played with who had two things she talked about all the time. The family's pet monkey and her big brother Larry. Years later I figured out big brother Larry was Larry Isla. Larry Isla, the highway killer. Thankfully there were no sleepovers. Fast forward to adulthood. Worked with a nurse who was a gay gentleman. Turned out he lived with and was lover to Orville Lynn Majors. Through a twist of fate, my now husband and his ex-wife used to play Yuko with Lynn Majors and his partner. That I worked with. Too close for comfort and really chills me that serial killers are that common. I was going to lunch with some co-workers. As we were going into the diner, a guy dressed in drag dang near knocks me over as he is rushing out of the door. Less than an hour later they arrested the same person, Robert Durst, in a nearby grocery store. I had no idea until I saw the news. A little late, 
but my mother and her ex-husband met John Wayne Gacy, apparently my mother's ex-husband, before my father, was a very shady character. He was on his way to becoming a junkie and was big time dealer. But mom says that she isn't 100% that this story was concerning drugs. I digress. Mom's ex-hub is all around criminal. And told mom that they were going to go collect on a debt. They get to his house. And no crap he has the basement blocked off and his concrete mix and construction crap everywhere. They go into his office where he sits behind his desk. The whole time mom says he is very stereotypically trying to stall her ex who was increasingly growing impatient with the situation. Then, John gets a phone call, and without hesitation answers it and kind of starts blowing off my mom and her ex. I should add mom's ex was super dangerous individual, who was a bouncer and bonafide butt kicker, so from the jump mom is worried that he is just going to beat the frick out of this guy. So Gacy is on the phone looking away, and mom's ex slowly walks up and dramatically takes phone out of Gacy's hand and slams it on the receiver, and says something cool but I can't remember, along lines of give me the money now you mother. Gacy is startled at first, but then gets this really weird look on his face, like he was trying to look crazy, tilts his head down while looking at ex-husband, then without saying anything quickly grabs checkbook from a drawer and writes a check. They leave without incident, and scene. She says after they left they were talking about how the guy gave them the creeps. How they could tell he was dangerous even though he didn't look or act like it. This didn't happen to me, but it actually happened to my father. During the 70s I believe, when he was in his late teens, early 20s, he was walking home from work late at night in the middle of winter in Chicago. A car pulled up alongside of him and with a very distinctive voice said hey do you need a ride somewhere my dad replied no, and kept walking. He walked a few more steps. And the car pulled up next to him again and the man inside said are you sure you don't need a ride? It's really cold out I don't mind dropping you off somewhere. My dad replied once again. No. But thank you anyway. The car drove off and my dad didn't think much of it until a few mil 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 a few The man who offered him a ride was John Wayne Gacy. One of the most notorious. Brutal serial killers of all time. Killing and physically assaulting around 33 young men in the 70s. When my dad heard on the news that they had caught the killer. And that it was indeed the man who offered him a ride that one night. He couldn't believe it. He had literally looked in the face of death. When I was a kid the people who lived across the road were family friends and the father murdered his wife and kids. Strangely enough thinking about it now I don't remember interacting with him even though I know I did. I didn't really find out what happened till a few years later since I was so young and my parents didn't want me to know until I was older. But I kind of figured it out anyway. I couldn't really say much about the guy but I think it's kind of affected my trust issues. Also my dad was talking to a truck driver at a stop somewhere up north about 25-30 years ago who intentionally drove his truck into a roadhouse or something. Me and my mom lived in Park City, KS through the 90s. BTK, Dennis Rader, was a compliance officer for the city, basically wrote citations for property compliance and handled animal control. He came to our house to write us up for not having our front lawn mowed to city requirements. Of course that was on me. My chores included keeping the grass mowed. Looking back, it definitely seems odd as the front yard grass wasn't super out of control or anything. At the time it just seemed like a guy who was serious about his job. I know when he worked as a security installation professional that he used those opportunities to scout for potential victims. Not sure he used his position as compliance officer to do the same sort of scouting but my guess is that he did. His last victim was in Park City in 91, though his visit to us was after that. Didn't think anything of it until he was arrested and my mom and I eventually realized that he had come to our house. Got into a taxi during rush hour, in the pouring rain, downtown. Thought, OMG I got a cab how lucky am I. Burned out by the time we got halfway to my house I knew he was playing games about not knowing how to get there. Had him drop me on a main street near my house. He tripled the fare. Got enraged. I threw all he requested and then some in the front seat and got out. Looked at the side of his cab and saw the logo was hand painted. And badly faked. And my heart sank as he screamed at me. I ran. He trolled me from his cab in the street while I ran into a storefront. Saw his face in the paper a couple months later. 
the serial debaucher and killer they'd been looking for. Our exchange was very heated. He terrified me, and I can still see his face in my mind. I dodged a violent encounter that day. I didn't know him and I don't think he'd qualify as a serial killer. But when I was pretty little there was a man in my parish who murdered his sister and her adult son and buried them in the backyard. His house was right up the street from the church and catholic school, so the gossip was endless. Apparently the cops were only called because all of the neighbors were complaining about the smell. My wife once saw Elizabeth Smart and her abductors. The story goes like this. I was 12 in the fall of 2002 and lived in El Cajun, California, where Brian David Mitchell was arrested for breaking into a local church the following February. My middle school was about 5 miles away from the lakeside, California Walmart where Elizabeth Smart and Wanda Barzi were spotted that September. I was getting my bike off the rack out front of the school so that I could ride home. It was then that I saw a grisly looking man and two women in what looked to be hijab. I thought that maybe they were Muslims and with 9 stroke 11 having happened just the year before, I knew I wanted to avoid them. The man looked right at me and I felt the coldest shiver of fear run down my spine. I got on my bike and left. Months later, I found out that the people I had seen were Elizabeth, Wanda Barzi and Brian David Mitchell. It was around that time according to reports that he was also looking to abduct another girl. I hate to think that it could have been me, but constantly wonder if I had realized anything if Elizabeth Smart would have been brought home that much sooner. Please do. Derek Bird, Cumbrian shooter, used to follow my mum round and ask her to go scuba diving with him. My dad says him fancying my mum should have been the first red flag. You dad kinda sounds like a dong. My friend lived across the street from the Green River Killer, Gary Ridgway, when he was a child. He said he has few memories of him, but he seemed like a nice, normal man. Serial killers are generally good at not standing out too much. I grew up a couple blocks away from Gary Ridgway and his wife worked for my father for a short time before he was accused of anything. I never met him but all my father's employees said the same thing about him when they met him. Kind of odd. A little quiet but overall a nice guy. His wife quit working for my dad when he first became the primary suspect. When I was about 12, in the 90s, a nice chap that lived on our neighborhood would sometimes hang out with us teenagers. He was about 50 at the time and worked for a local paper writing on social events. He usually would tell us histories from the dictatorship era here in Brazil and some from his early life on the stage. I guess he was not a serial, but simply a killer. A few years later we discovered that he was being prosecuted for the murder of his first wife. Sometime during the 70s stroke ATS, he requested a divorce and she denied. A few months later they agreed to try to sort things out going to a romantic trip at a desert beach. Well, he strangled and buried her, thinking no one was watching them. The fact is that a lone fisherman saw the whole thing, but as far as I remember, was either too afraid or distant to help. Sometime afterwards, the fisherman was able to dig her out but she was already dead. The autopsy found a few pounds of beach sand in her lungs, meaning she was buried alive. This guy never showed any signs of being a killer, and was actually quite funny at the time. Eventually he was arrested, but sometime later was moved to a prison hospital due to poor health and escaped after a few days. He passed away after a couple years, and I am pretty sure he did not spend even a whole year in prison. What scares me, our total inability to recognize him as a killer psycho, not even a hint. My grandpa's aunt bought meat from Edgine and served it to the family on more than one occasion. Was probably normal meat, but super creepy still. Apparently he was just a loner guy in town, but not threatening or anything. I knew an almost mass murderer and he was an acquaintance of mine. He was a server in a bar I frequented and I'd see him around town a lot. I didn't know him well, mainly casual conversation when I did see him. He was always really nice and polite and we had some mutual friends. Then later I read the news and the FBI picked him up for planning to open fire at a specific location in the city. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video.
bye for now.